Hello everyone. Welcome to another interesting session of our DSA course. And today's topic is Omega Notation. If you are unaware, this is a premium DSA course which covers from beginners to advanced level of DSA, which includes multiple sections of coding, doubt clearing, and many more exciting stuff. So, without much delay, Without any second thoughts, like, comment, and subscribe to this channel. So now, with a positive note, with a greater enthusiasm, let's start today's session. So the name of our topic is Omega Notation. It is one of the three important notations from the asymptotic notation. In the last lecture, we have covered the big O notation. If you did not watch the previous video, I will recommend you to please watch the previous videos so that the upcoming videos will be more clearer to you. Okay, so let's start. So, coming to the mathematical representation of omega notation, let's have a look at what the function says. Let g and f be the function from the set of natural numbers to itself. The function f is said to be omega of g if there is a constant c is greater than 0 and a natural number n naught such that c into g of n is less than equal to f of n for all n is greater than equal to n naught. You must be thinking, ma'am, just read out the lines. Okay, I know it's a bit tougher for you. No worries, let's simplify it. So look at the mathematical presentation in the next line. So omega of g, is it, it is written in the set builder form is equivalent to f of n such that there should exist a positive constant c and n naught such that it's a typo here it's n naught so such that n naught is less than equal to c into g of n is less than equal to f n for all n is greater than equal to n naught if you might remember i told you while we were studying the theory of these notations that Omega notation covers both the lower bound and the upper bound. So it is restricted to a certain range. So it is C. The C into G of N is restricted to N naught and F of N. For all N is greater than or equal to N naught. Now you are clear. That's why I am telling you just to go through the previous lectures. Things will be very clearer to you. Okay. In the next slide. I am sorry I just ended the animation. Okay no problem. Let's move to the next slide. So, this is a graphical representation of what mathematically we studied in the previous slide. Let's just look at the graphical structure. So, in case of omega notation, your particular function lies between a certain limit. That is in the lower range, lower bound and upper, range, upper bound. Got it? Next slide. So, how do you calculate the big omega for any program? Interesting question. In the last lecture we studied about the big O notation and how to calculate it. But now we will be looking at the big omega and let's see how to calculate the big omega for any program. So what do you do? Break the program into smaller segments for better understanding. Then find the number of operations performed for each segment. So you need to see that for a particular input size, what are the number of operations performed and you have to assume that the given input takes the least amount of time. With this assumption, you need to move forward. Then add up all the operations and simplify it. Let's say the operations add an addition is f of n. Then you remove all the constants and you need to choose a term having the least order or any other function that is always less than f of n because this is the, it lies between the lower bound and upper bound. What do you do in the big omega, uh, in the big O notation? You always discarded the lower order terms. But in case of big omega, you take the list order term which is less than f of n. That is summation of all the operations when n tends to infinity. Okay. So you rep represent the big omega of f of n as this, big omega of g of n. Next slide. Let's look at a code. Let's run a code and let's see what do we get as the output. 
for this is not just a theoretical course you need to have an understanding about the code as well so see i have written just let me clear it out okay so i have written the program here so this is a program to print all the pairs possible pairs so i have taken an array of 1 2 3 the length of the array is 3 and here in the print pairs function i took an array and n as input that parameters are being passed then there is a loop for i in range n for j in range this is a nested loop if i is not equivalent to j if those two numbers are not same then print the indexes the number like the particular element in the index okay so now let's run it okay so you got this numbers 1 2 1 3 2 1 2 3 3 1 and 3 2 so you got the program so now why did i say this that showed the boundaries look at the graphical representation your g n lies between this is a linear line this is a constant line and this is a quadratic line and for a certain value and not just look at the distinction when do you need to use the big omega notation it is mostly not used for analyzing algorithms because we always use big o or big theta because big theta compares the lower order and big o is upper bound big theta is lower bound so it describes the lower bounds of an algorithm's performance but it lacks information about the upper bounds so it basically describes your lower bound of an algorithm but it does not tell you about the upper bound this can lead to imprecise statements because it only specifies a minimum performance guaranteed without specifying the maximum so it only says about the minimum performance it guarantees the minimum lower bound but it does not specify the maximum for example if someone takes 100 minutes to complete a task starting that they take more than 10 minutes using big omega notation is correct but it is imprecise because it does not mention the upper bound. So, you know the lower bound, the 10 minutes are required to complete a task. And the total amount is 100 minutes. If someone takes 100 minutes, so they take, just it is uh, said that they take more than 10 minutes. But you do not know what is the maximum amount of time that person knows. You just know that they take more than 10 minutes, but you do not know what amount of time that person takes. Similarly, see. If you do not understand anything, just go to the mathematical representation and just have a look. So, this is the mathematical representation. See, C of G n lies between n naught and f of n for all n is greater than n naught. So, it only specifies your lower bound. It doesn't have to, have to do anything with the upper bound. You just know that it should be less than or equal to f of n. That's it. That's why it's not used commonly. Okay. Similarly, stating that the worst case running time of binary search is big omega of 1 is accurate in that it implies the algorithm takes at least constant time, but it doesn't provide the worst case time analysis, the upper bound. See, for the binary search, you know that the worst case running time, you do not know what is the worst case running time. You know that it returns big omega of 1. But it doesn't tell you about the upper bound. It doesn't give you any information about the upper bound of the time complexity. So, in that case, it becomes like it is really very important to use the big O because it provides, it uh, tells you, it gives you more precise information about the upper bound, about the worst case time complexity. Got it?